<clears throat> nobody, 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 nobody. Nobody rage hard stories. Oh my goodness, Megan, there's already people waiting for us. Hi, I'm Jeremy. And I'm Megan. And you're watching Nobody Reads Short Stories, where we do short stories. Yes, so you can find all of our previous episodes on our website, nobodyreadshortstories.com. And tonight is episode four of season three. Every year, every season, we like to do an episode for the dead authors. And this yeah. This season, we decided to go with Grimm's Fairy Tales. So first up, we have Cinderella. One moment. Cinderella. There was once a rich man whose wife lay sick, and when she fell, her end drawing near, she called to her only daughter to come near her bed and said, Dear child, be good and pious, and God will always take care of you, and I will look down upon you from heaven and will be with you. And then she closed her eyes and died. The maiden went every day to her mother's grave and wept and was always pious and good. When the winter came, the snow covered the grave with a white covering, and when the sun came in the early spring and melted away, the man took to himself another wife. The new wife brought two daughters home with her and they were beautiful and fair in appearance, but at heart were black and ugly. And then began very evil times for the poor stepdaughter. Is the stupid creature to sit in the same room with us? They said, those who eat food must earn it. She is nothing but a kitchen maid. They took away her pretty dresses and put on her an old gray kirtle and gave her wooden shoes to wear. Just look at the proud, just look now at the proud princess, how she is decked out, cried they laughing. And when they sent her into the kitchen, there she was obliged to do heavy work from morning to night. Get up early in the morning, draw water, make the fires, cook and wash. Besides that, the sisters did their utmost to torment her, mocking her and stewing peas and lentils among the ashes and setting her to pick them up. In the evenings, when she was quite tired out with her hard day's work, she had no bed to lie on, but was obliged to rest on the hearth among the cinders. And because she always looked dusty and dirty, as if she had slept in the cinders, they named her Cinderella. It happened one day that the father went to the fair and he asked his two stepdaughters what he should bring back for them. Fine clothes, said one. Pearls and jewels, said the other. But what will you have, Cinderella, said he. The first twig, father, that strikes against your hat on the way home, that is what I should like you to bring me. So he bought for the two stepdaughters fine clothes, pearls, and jewels. And on his way back, as he rode through a green lane, a hazel twig struck against his hat, and he broke it off and carried it home with him. And when he reached home, he gave to the stepdaughters what they had wished for, and to Cinderella, he gave the hazel twig. She thanked him and went to her mother's grave and planted this twig there, weeping so bitterly that the tears fell upon it and watered it, and it flourished and became a fine tree. Cinderella went to see it three times a day and wept and prayed, and each time a white bird rose up from the tree, and if she uttered any wish, the bird brought her whatever she had wished for. Now it came to pass that the king ordained a festival that should last for three days, and to which all the beautiful young women of that country were bidden so that the king's son might choose a bride from among them. When the two stepdaughters heard that they too were bidden to appear, they felt very pleased, and they called Cinderella and said, Comb our hair, brush our shoes, and make our buckles fast. We are going to the wedding feast at the king's castle. When she heard this, Cinderella could not help crying, 
for she too would have liked to go to the dance, and she begged her stepmother to allow her. What? You, Cinderella, said she, in all your dust and dirt, you want to go to the festival? You that have no dress and no shoes? You want to dance? But as she persisted in asking, at last the stepmother said, I have stewed a dish full of lentils in the ashes, and you can pick them all up again in two hours. You may go with us. Then the maiden went to the back door that led into the garden and called out, O gentle doves, O turtle doves, and all the birds that be, the lentils that in ashes lie, come and pick up for me. The good must be put in the dish, the bad but you may eat if you wish. Then there came to the kitchen window two white doves, and after them turtle doves, and at last a crowd of all the birds under heaven chirping and fluttering, and they delighted among the ashes. And the doves nodded with their heads and began to pick peck, pick peck. And then all the others began to pick peck, pick peck, and put all the good grains into the dish. Before an hour was all over, before an hour was over, all was done, and they flew away. Then the maiden brought the dish to her stepmother, feeling joyful and thinking that now she should go to the feast. But the stepmother said, No, Cinderella, you have no proper clothes, and you do not know how to dance, and you would be laughed at. When Cinderella cried for disappointment, she said, If you can pick two dishes full of lentils out of the ashes, nice and clean, you shall go with us, thinking to herself, for that is not possible. And she had stewed two dishes full of lentils among the ashes. The maiden went through the back door into the garden and cried, O oh, gentle doves, O oh, turtle doves, and all the birds that be, the lentils that in ashes lie, come and pick up for me. The good must be put in the dish, the bad you may eat if you wish. So there came to the kitchen window two white doves and then some turtle doves. And at last, a crowd of all the other birds under heaven, chirping and fluttering, and they alighted among the ashes. And the doves nodded with their heads and began to pick, peck, pick, peck. And then all the others began to pick, peck, pick, peck, and put all the grains into the dish. And before half an hour was all over, it was done, and they flew away. Then the maiden took the dishes to the stepmother, feeling joyful and thinking that now she should go with them to the feast. But she said, all this is no good to you. You cannot come with us for you have no proper clothes and cannot dance. You would put us to shame. Then she turned her back on poor Cinderella and made haste to set out with her two proud daughters. And as there was no one left in the house, Cinderella went to her mother's grave under the hazel bush and cried, little tree, little tree, shake over me, that silver and gold may come down and cover me. Then the bird flew down a dress of gold and silver and a pair of slippers embroidered with silk and silver. And in all haste, she put on the dress and went to the festival. But her stepmother and sisters did not know her and thought she must be a foreign princess. She looked so beautiful in her golden dress. Of Cinderella, they never thought at all, and supposed that she was sitting at home and picking the lentils out of the ashes. The king's son came to meet her and took her by the hand and danced with her, and he refused to stand up with anyone else, so that he might not be obliged to let go her hand. And when anyone came to claim her, he answered, she is my partner. And when the evening came, she wanted to go home, but the prince said he would go with her to take care of her for he wanted to see where the beautiful maiden lived. But she escaped him and jumped up into the pigeon house. Then the prince waited until the father came and told him the strange maiden had jumped into the pigeon house. The father thought to himself, it surely cannot be Cinderella, and called for axes and hatchets and had the pigeon house cut down. But there was no one in it. And when they entered the house, there sat Cinderella in her dirty clothes among the cinders and a little oil lamp burned dimly in the chimney. For Cinderella had been very quick, 
and had jumped out of the pigeon house again and had run to the hazel bush. And there she had taken off her beautiful dress and laid it on the grave and the bird had carried it away again. And then she had put on her little gray kirtle again and had sat down in the kitchen among the cinders. The next day when the festival began anew and the parents and stepsisters had gone to it, Cinderella went to the hazel bush and cried, little tree, little tree, shake over me, that silver and gold may come down and cover me. Then the bird cast down a still more splendid dress than on the day before. And when she appeared in it among the guests, everyone was astonished at her beauty. The prince had been waiting until she came and he took her hand and danced with her alone. And when anyone else came to invite her, he said, she is my partner. And when the evening came, she wanted to go home and the prince followed her for he wanted to see at what house she belonged. But she broke away from him and ran into the garden at the back of the house. There stood a fine, large tree bearing splendid pears. She leapt as lightly as a squirrel among the branches and the prince did not know what had become of her. So he waited until the father came, and then he told him that the strange maiden had rushed from him and that he thought she had gone up into the pear tree. Father thought to himself, it surely cannot be Cinderella, and called for an ax and failed the tree, but there was no one in it. And when they went into the kitchen, there sat Cinderella among the cinders as usual, for she had got down the other side of the tree and had taken back her beautiful clothes to the bird in the hazel bush and had put on her old gray kirtle again. On the third day, when the parents and the stepchildren had set off, Cinderella went again to her mother's grave and said to the tree, little tree, little tree, shake over me that silver and gold may come down and cover me. Then the bird cast down a dress the like of which had never been seen for splendor and brilliancy and slippers that were made of gold. And when she appeared in this dress at the feast, nobody knew what to say for wonderment. The prince danced with her alone. And if anyone else asked her, he answered, she is my partner. And when it was evening, Cinderella wanted to go home and the prince was about to go with her when she ran past him so quickly that he could not follow her. But he had laid a plan and had caused all the steps to be spread with pitch so that as she rushed down them, the left shoe of the maiden remained sticking in it. The prince picked it up and saw that it was gold and very small and slender. The next morning, he went to the father and told him that none should be his bride save the one whose foot the golden shoe should fit. Then the two sisters were very glad because they had pretty feet. The eldest went to her room to try on the shoe and her mother stood by, but she could not get her great toe into it for the shoe was too small. Then her mother handed her a knife and said, cut the toe off for when you are queen, you will never have to go on foot. So the girl cut off her toe, squeezed her foot into the shoe, concealed the pain, and went down to the prince. Then he took her with him on horse as his bride and rode off. They had to pass by the grave and there sat the two pigeons on the hazel bush and they cried, there they go, there they go. There is blood on her shoe. The shoe is too small, not the right bride at all. Then the prince looked at her shoe and saw the blood flowing and he turned his horse around and took the false bride home again saying she was not the right one and that the other sister must try on the shoe. So she went into her room to do so and got her shoes comfortably, her toes comfortably in, but her heel was too large. Then her mother handed her the knife saying, cut a piece off your heel. When you are clean, you will never have to go on foot. So the girl cut a piece of off her heel and thrust her foot into the shoe, concealed the pain, and went down to the prince, who took his bride before him on his horse and rode off. When they passed by the hazel bush, the two pigeons sat there and cried, there they go, there they go, there is blood on her shoe. 
The shoe is too small, not the right bright at all. Then the prince looked at her foot and saw how the blood was flowing from the shoe and staining the white stocking. And he turned his horse around and brought the false bride home again. This is not the right one, he said. Have you no other daughter? Oh, said the man, only my dead wife left behind her a little stunted Cinderella. It is impossible that she can be the bride. The king's son ordered her to be sent for, but the mother said, Oh no, she is much too dirty. She could not let her be seen. But he would have her fetched, and so Cinderella had to appear. First she washed her face and hands quite clean, and went in and curtsied to the prince, who held out to her the golden shoe. Then she sat down on a stool, drew her foot out of the heavy wooden shoe, and slipped it into the golden one, which fitted it perfectly. And when she stood up and the prince looked at her face, he knew again the beautiful maiden that had danced with him, and he cried, This is the right bride! The stepmother and the two sisters were thunderstruck and grew pale with anger. But he put Cinderella before him on his horse and rode off. And as they passed the hazel bush, the two white pigeons cried, there they go, there they go, no blood on her shoe. The shoe's not too small, the right bride is she after all. And when they had thus cried, they came flying after and perched on Cinderella's shoulders, one on the right, the other on the left, and so remained. And when her wedding with the prince was appointed to be held, the false sisters came, hoping to curry favor and to take part in the festivities. So as the bridal procession went to the church, the eldest walked on the right and the younger on the left, and the pigeons picked out an eye of each of them. And as they returned, the elder was on the left and the younger on the right, and the pigeons picked out the other eye of each of them. And so they were condemned to go blind for the rest of their days because of their wickedness and falsehood. The end. Oh, Jeremy, I think you're on mute. There you go. I, I still mean it. Good read, Megan. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, I'm passing the baton. Ooh, passing the baton. Passing the baton. Pass Ooh, I got that baton. Go. Ooh. All right, everybody. We're going to do a book. Ooh. The Robber Bi Bridegroom. There was once on a time a miller who had a beautiful daughter, and as she was grown up, he wished that she was provided for and well married. He thought, if any good suitor comes and asks for her, I will give her to him. Not long afterwards, a suitor came who appeared to be very rich. And as the miller had no fault to find with him, he promised his daughter to him. The maiden, however, did not like him quite so much as a girl should like a man to whom she is engaged and had no confidence in him. Whenever she saw or thought of him, she felt a secret horror. Once he said to her, thou art my betrothed and yet thou hast never once paid me a visit. The maiden replied, I know not where thy house is. Then said the bridegroom, my house is out there in the dark forest. She tried to excuse herself and said she could not find the way there. The bridegroom said, next Sunday, thou must come out there to me. I have already invited the guests and I will strew ashes in order that thou may find thy way through the forest. When Sunday came and the maiden had to set out on her way, she became very uneasy. She herself knew not exactly why. And to mark her way, she filled both her pockets full of peas and lentils. Ashes were strewn at the entrance of the forest, and these she followed. But at every step, she threw a couple of peas on the ground. She walked almost the whole day until she reached the middle of the forest, where it was the darkest. And there stood a solitary house, which she did not like, for it looked so dark and dismal. She went inside it, but no one was within, and the most absolute stillness reigned. Suddenly a voice cried, 
Turn back, turn back, young maiden dear. Tis a murderer's house you enter here. The maiden looked up and saw that the voice came from a bird, which was hanging in a cage on the wall. Again it cried, Turn back, turn back, young maiden dear. Tis a murderer's house you enter here. Then the young maiden went on farther from one room to another and walked through the whole house but it was entirely empty and not one human being was to be found. At last she came to the cellar and there sat an extremely aged woman whose head shook constantly. Can you not tell me, said the maiden, if my betrothed lives here? Alas, poor child, replied the old woman, whither hast thou come? Thou art in a murderous den. Thou thinkest thou art a bride soon to be married, but thou wilt keep thy wedding with death. Look, I have been forced to put a great kettle on there with water in it, and when they have thee in their power, they will cut thee to pieces without mercy, will cook thee and eat thee, for they are eaters of human flesh. If I do not have compassion on thee and save thee, thou art lost." Thereupon the old woman led her behind a great hogshead, where she could not be seen. Be still as a mouse, said she. Do not make a sound, or move, or all will be over with thee. At night, when the robbers are asleep, we will escape. I have long waited for an opportunity. Hardly was this done. Then the godless crew came home. They dragged with them another young girl. They were drunk and paid no heed to her screams and lamentations. They gave her wine to drink, three glasses full of one white wine, the other red, and a glass of yellow. And with this, her heart burst in twain. Thereupon, they tore off her delicate raiment, led her onto the table, cut her beautiful body in pieces, and strewed salt thereon. The poor bride behind the cask trembled and shook, for she saw right well what fate the robbers had destined for her. One of them noticed a gold, fit, gold ring on the little finger of the murdered girl, and as it would not come off at once, he took an axe and cut the finger off, but it sprang up in the air away over the cask and fell straight into the bride's bosom. The robber took a candle and wanted to look for it, but could not find it. Then another of them said, Hast thou looked behind the great hog's head? But the old woman cried, Come and get something to eat, and leave off looking till the morning. The finger won't run away from you. Then the robber said, The old woman is right, and gave up their search and sat down to eat. And the old woman poured a sleeping drought in their wine, so that they soon lay down in the cellar and slept and snored. When the bride heard that, she came out from behind the hogshead and had to step over the sleepers, for they lay in rows in the ground, and great was her terror lest she could waken one of them. But God helped her, and she got safely over. The old woman went up with her, opened the doors, and they hurried out of the murderer's den with all the speed in their power. The wind had blown away the strewn ashes. But the peas and lentils had sprouted and grown up and showed the way in the moonlight. They walked the whole night until in the morning they arrived at the mill. And then the maiden told her father everything exactly as it happened. When the day came, when the wedding was to be celebrated, the bridegroom appeared. And the miller had invited all his relations and friends. And they sat at that table. Each was bidden to relate something. The bride sat still and said nothing. Then said the bridegroom to the bride, Come, my darling, dost thou know nothing? Relate something to let us rest. She replied, Then I will relate a dream. I was walking alone through a wood, and at last I came to a house in which no living soul was, but on the wall there was a bird in a cage which cried, Turn back, turn back, young maiden dear. Tis a murderer's house you enter here. And this is it, cried once more. My darling, 
I only dreamt it, don't worry. Then I went through all the rooms, and they were all empty, and there was something so horrible about them. At last I went down into the cellar, and there sat a very, very old woman, whose head shook, and I asked her, does my bridegroom live in this house? She answered, alas, poor child, thou has got into a murderer's den. Thy bridegroom does live here, but he will hew thee in pieces and kill thee, and then he will cook thee and eat thee. But don't worry, my darling. I'm only telling you this because it's a dream. But the old woman hid me behind a great hogshead, and I scarcely was hidden when the robbers came home, dragging a maiden with them, to whom they gave three kinds of wine to drink, white, red, and yellow, with, wheat, with which her heart broke in twain. My darling, don't worry, because I'm just telling you a dream. Thereupon they pulled off her pretty clothes and hewed her fair body in pieces on a table and sprinkled them with salt. My darling, don't worry, I'm only telling you this because it's a dream. And one of the robbers saw that there was still a ring on her little finger. And as it was hard to draw off, he took an ax and cut it off. But the finger sprang up in the air and sprang behind the great hog's head and fell in my bosom. And there is the finger with the ring. And with these words, she drew it forth and showed it to all those present. The robber who had during the story became as pale as ashes, leapt up and wanted to escape, but the guests held him fast and delivered him over to justice. Then he and his whole troop were executed for their infamous deeds. The end. Ooh, good job, Jeremy. That was really good and gruesome. It's so gruesome, right? Yeah, that's... that's oh, like we need a cranky talk. We do need cranky. Okay, let's get cranky let's going. Get cranky, or else we'll talk for twenty five hundred hours. It's true. Um, so I'm gonna set cranky for seven minutes. So tonight we don't have because you know the brothers Grimm's aren't alive, and it takes some serious smelling salt to get them on the show. Um, we're no interviews. So Jeremy and I are just gonna talk about our impressions of the Brothers Grimm. So one thing I wanted to say right up from the start is that the Brothers Grimm has been edited and it has been edited again and it has been edited again. And this started since the beginning of them telling the stories. So the actual stories, like you're like, these are really, really dark. Well, get this, like things were changing in that time period, like when they were originally getting recorded. And so people were already having issues with how violent the stories were. So these were like done down by Brother Scrim, like even in that time period. And as we travel through time, people become even more squeamish. So what was interesting about the robber's bridegroom is that there were two versions <laughs> and I decided to do the more volatile, uh, more, I don't know, like, what would you say more? Brutal? Brutal, yeah, or version of the story. Yeah. Well, you also have to think about when these stories were being collected. I mean, they were being collected from oral traditions and from, um, you know, peasants and, and people who they would run into and they would collect these oral stories in the 1700s, which was not like the most peaceful time to live. And I know, thought it was the, so peaceful. Yeah, I mean, you know, didn't they have like just people, like people didn't live that long? People they had rose cake. They had diseases. You know, there wasn't a lot of like happy times going on, and so people drew from. If you know about folk tales and oral traditions and just like traditional stories to begin with, like they they told these stories based on their own experiences and what they saw day to day. And, and usually that was, that was pretty gruesome. Um, so, so yeah. And then as, you know, as life has gotten a little bit easier for those who are writing stories, um, we've cleaned them up a little bit and made them a little bit happier. And, you know, um, I like them dark. I, I was telling Megan when we weren't on the show, we were just having fun. And um, I told Megan how cool it would be to have some of these actually be horror stories. Like if you were to adapt them into a filmic horror, why hasn't that really been done? I mean, we, we, we have done it, but they never go back to the original story and mm -hmm. appreciate that it is hor horrific. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it's really interesting to like, when you look and you see what all the different iterations of Brothers Grimm has come out, like there's TV shows and there's movies about them individually. And then there's about their, their tales. And then, you know, everything was Disney fied. And then there's all these fairy tales from the Disney vault, excuse me. And um, so it, it's really interesting to me how these stories evolved. And that's kind of the, the mm. essence of oral tradition. Like you yeah. have these stories that are told person to person. That's and of true. course you add things and you take things away and it evolves. And then it was written down and then it was edited again and then it became oral again. And then it, it's, it's very, it's very secular and very vibrant and, and it moves and it grows and it becomes that's something really different. Point. It's and a so really I, good point that we grab on and we, we, we're continuing to make the story. Yeah. It's almost like, we, yeah, it's almost like we're continuing on and like, we're just, you know, we've been in this phase with these fairy tales of the Disney version is the version of, you know, our childhoods. And uh, I think it'll be interesting to see kind of like what the next mm. iteration of these story tell. I mean, we've already kind of gone a little bit darker, but I think it'll be interesting to see kind of like what else comes out of fairy tales. And I, I just think the idea of a fairy tale is really interesting. It's something that, so many people gravitate toward and that everybody wants to sit down and hear a good story. Right. And so when you have these elements of the, you have the witch and you have magic and you have this repetition and you have like, it's all very comforting. Like even when it's gruesome, it's still like just listening to you read. I, I feel myself being like, Oh yeah. Yeah. And everybody gets what they deserve in the end. And it's very satisfying. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons why fairy tales were created was so that people can kind of be, it's almost like a, a rule book, because you can mm -hmm. see how society views certain things, like you see what things are bad and what things are good. And interesting enough, um, one of the books I recently read was talking about uh, fairy tales and how there's a theory that uh, it was also like fairy tales were used for telling them to children because it allows children to see the different parts in themselves because there's the witch and then there's there's all these different characters that we all have inside ourselves. We have the awful person, we have the wolf, we have the prince, we have the princess, you know, we have the wise person. So I just thought that was kind of cool too, that it was a way for, a. a a child to use their imagination to be able to see the different different things going on in their psychology. Oh, that is interesting. Yeah, and then that makes me think of Peter and the Wolf, and like usually that you know that that the music and orchestra and these different parts that come in and different instruments that come yeah, in. Yeah, it's the it's wolf that. And it's uh, this. It was a psychology book, and it was talking about how when you're a child. It's uh, you have these multiple voices in your head. Like it's like when you're a gremlin and you do something really awful, and your parent is like, "What got into you?" Like mm -hmm. it's because they're not able to connect all of these different individual parts into one being yet, and yeah. so this kind of helps with that. Oh, like fairy tales kind of help with that. I just thought that was really fascinating to hear. That is that is really cool. Like I like to think about the psychology of story and how how it helps us figure out our lives. Yeah. Right? And figure yeah. out who we are. Um, and, and they hold up too. Like they're really interesting to listen to. I really love, I and mean, we don't do this much anymore with stories, but the verbal repetition. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I love the verbal really repetition. Really interesting. Yeah. And I was thinking, like, okay, so what does that do? Like, what is that? Like, I know That's in the oral tradition, they did it so that you could just remember it, right? Like the more you say it over and over again, yeah. it's easier to remember. But I think that there's something like almost enchanting or like magical. It's enchanting, yeah. It's very yeah. soothing, very enchanting. Yeah, about just the repetition and like you kind of know, okay, this is gonna happen again and there's gonna be a little bit of a change and there's gonna be a big change. Be at the third, oh. be it the third time, um, yeah. So, so Maureen, actually, are we allowed to still? Uh, yeah, read? yeah, let's yeah. see Maureen. So Maureen said, Hi, great Maureen. reading, Megan. Surprised oh, I never you. heard Brothers Grimm, Cinderella. That's cool. And then she also said, another great read, Jeremy. Wow, the Grimm tales are grim. Never heard the Brothers Grimm either. And like, uh, never heard this, uh, the Robert Bridegroom either. 
enlightening. Wow. Yeah. And the Robert Bridegroom is interesting for me because um, Eudora Welty, who's a wonderful short story writer, has um, a book called The Robert Bridegroom and it's been uh, made into a play and um, other iterations. And then also Margaret Atwood has a book called yeah. The Robert Bride, which is completely different, but yet very, if, you, if you've ever read that book and then you read this story, you can definitely see the mythology and the, the symbolism of why she chose that title because it's, uh, it's just about more like women eating women as opposed to, <laughs> uh, not, not literally, but figuratively and emotionally. I would not um, be surprised with M Margaret Atwood. She yeah, does it's, interesting it's, things. Yeah, she really does. She has a way of, of encapsulating the female to female experience in all of its horror and terror <laughs> and um, meanness in a way that's just, this is terrifying, um, but also very true and very honest and cathartic. So uh, she's the queen of that. Well, anyway, we cheated. All right, we cheated a little bit just because this is a little bit of a, a yeah. shorter episode. Um, so if you haven't already, please go to our website and um, check out our YouTube page and like and subscribe and uh, let us know what you thought of tonight's readings and tonight's story. Let us know what your favorite fairy tales are, grim or otherwise. Ooh, yes. And um, and if you're listening to our previous episodes, please um, leave us a note. Let our authors know. They love to hear feedback from fans and so do we. So don't be shy. And if you're liking our show and you're just tuning in or if you tuned in for a while and you know that we're producing really good content, let your friends and family know that we're out here producing th free things. Like I know personally a lot of people who are just looking for free audiobooks. So let them know we're here. Yeah, like send it to all your all your fans of literature, your fans of story, short stories and people who love podcasts. You know, we're found on Spotify, iTunes, Apple Podcasts. Uh, Spotify, Stitcher. Uh, it's so easy to just download us into your phone and have us with you wherever you want to go. And anytime that you have a few minutes or you want to listen to a story while you're you're cleaning your bathroom or what have you, like we're we're there for you. We sure are, and we are also there for you on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And Megan, I am doing better on segues today than I was last week. Yeah, yes. you're killing it. You're killing yes. it. So if you use our Twitter, you will do best if you use the, oh no, am I going to get this right? The hashtag NRSS podcast. Very good, Jeremy. Yes. Very good. Jeremy and I also have individual uh, project, uh, individual websites. So if you're interested in our personal projects, you can go to my website, which is meganamorrison.com. And if you sign up for notifications, you will get an email every time I have an update about something cool that's going on with my projects. And Jeremy. Same thing. I also do micro stories and they are like microscopic stories. So if you like small, these are really small. And you're like, that's ridiculous. You can't tell us a story like microscopically. You can, I do. Yeah, and uh, Jeremy also has books on Amazon. So oh my goodness, sure I always that... forget this. Yeah, yeah, so his stories, The House Plant and also The Gatherings are on Amazon. So if you haven't read those, you haven't gotten your physical copy of those, make sure that you check that out. And, uh, we're... Oh, I was gonna say, and if you're watching this later, I'll also have Petrified Women up there which is coming out very soon. <gasps> That's exciting. Brand new story. That's a brand new story. We have not featured that story here on the show. So and we that never will be... because it's way too long. It is not a short story. <laughs> so that will be brand new Jeremy Ray story. So make sure that you, you get your copy when that's available. Um, Speaking of writers, if you know them, and we are always <laughs> accepting submissions to our show, we'll be doing season four. Um, so please make sure that you tell them about our submission opportunity. You can go to nobodyreadshortstories.com and find all of our information. Uh, we can't wait to read all of your stories. One of the things that I personally love about this show, and I know that Jeremy and Mark love too, is just how many um, new writers we get to meet and, and sharing their story and giving them a platform to, show a, to share a story that might not have another platform to get it to have its voice heard is just really it's really cool and it's really fun and um i'm just so so happy that so many people have wanted to share their stories with us and you've given us this too. opportunity 
Me too. So thank and you, just, everybody. Yeah, thank you. And I mean, it's so frustrating because they're so good. And then you hear that nobody's done these stories. And I'm like, why? Yeah. Why? Yeah. And, and so speaking of stories nobody's ever done, make sure that you come back next week because we have our first ever erotica story on Nobody Read Short Stories. It's going to be... Um, it's going to be a fine night. Uh, it's, it's the wonderful J.C. Anderson has written a story called The First Experience. And, experience First, excuse me, Experience First. And um, it's going to be it's going to be pretty amazing and very cool for Nobody Reads. Um, so make sure that you check it out if that's your thing. I just had a visual, Megan, that people are watching this with somebody else, like while this is going on, and they yeah. were like. Oh, I'm gonna be watching that show, uh, but I'm not gonna be watching it with you. <laughs> well, we might actually have more viewers because everybody's watching it separately well, in their little room. But if you're into that, if you're into listening and watching, you know, somebody read erotica with your partner, oh, yeah. that's cool. Oh yeah, yeah. you do that. You, you do, do that. that. You have that you chocolate. You. you have candles. You do. Uh, I almost said. Uh, I don't know what I. I almost said pellet leaves. <laughs> that's not right. Rose petals. <laughs> Rose petals, that's right. Pellet leaves, I don't know what that is. That's, I don't know either. That's not um, something romantic that's been beaten into our heads for Valentine's Day, so I don't know what it means. Well, let's not beat anything into our heads. Let's put <laughs> soft pillows on our heads. Yeah! Oh, way. good transition! We forgot. To, so Jeremy is leaning his head against a beautiful Nobody Read Short Stories pillow, and you can have this pillow too. All you not have to one. do. I'm not giving this one. Well, not that one exactly, but you can have it's twin. So go to nobodyreadshortstories.com. Check out our merchandise page. We have pillows. We have fanny packs. We have socks. We have leggings. We have hoodies. We have dog shirts. We have phone cases. We have everything that your heart could desire. Megan is climaxing. This and is perfect. R F merchandise. <laughs> <sighs> This is this is when ha when Harry met Sally. I love it. Yeah, this is she when is Harry met Sally. She's preparing for erotica piece next week. Nobody hey, reads that, was good. that was preview. Really good. Preview. Of what's going to happen next week? So Ooh, make I just sure got that a little hot. Oh, Ooh. I know. I'm getting warm. Um, we gotta go. I gotta like, bring my fan next time to cool myself. I really off. do think we need to go right now. Yeah. Mark, okay, we're gonna go. Fans? This was way too hot. We'll see you next week. Bye. <laughs> Bye. No one reads short stories anymore I really don't know what they're written for Go write a short story and throw it out the door Cause no one reads short stories Funny, sad, or gory No one reads short stories Yes, no one reads your story